Hello all my friends out there in YouTube land, it's me Logan Albright back with another book review for your viewing pleasure. And today I thought I'd talk about an author who I've talked about before on the channel, Jack London. And before, if you recall, I did a review of this wonderful Library of America volume um, about most of his most well-known novels and short stories, talking about how great they are and how much I love his writing. He's, you know, very great adventure writer, talks about the the great far north, the Klondike, Canada, Alaska, places like that, and talks about animals in a very moving, evocative way. But there's a second volume, which I have here, also by Library of America, this identical volume, which contains more novels, but also, more importantly, a lot of his political and social writing. Um, Jack London was famously a socialist, and he talks about kind of his motivations for his political beliefs in this book. So I started reading The People of the Abyss, which I thought was a novel, but it turns out it's actually not a novel. It's a first-hand account of Jack London's visit to the east end of the city where he gets his name from, the city of London, uh, to kind of immerse himself and live amongst the poorer working classes in London's east end in the year 1902, where kind of coming on the heels of the Industrial Revolution, things were pretty bad, and he wanted to see how those people lived. It feels a lot like something like Upton Sinclair's The Jungle, which I think he was influenced by. Um, and it's sort of this, this social experiment where he goes in and tries to live as one of the lower classes and see what it's like for them. And this is the experience he had. It's actually a really interesting book. It's pretty short. It's about 180 pages. And I really enjoyed it. I thought it was a, a great documentary of what life was like in that time period. So in The People of the Abyss, uh, he details a lot of interesting first-hand accounts. He talks about getting lodging. He talks about getting work, um, lining up outside these workhouses every day and trying to like get in to get enough, uh, to get some, some small amount of money to pay his expenses. And they'd only take like 20 people a day. So if you didn't get there hours in advance to wait in line, you would uh, be out of luck. He actually complains about the government workhouses and says they're much worse than the private ones and that they're kind of abusive and he doesn't like the way the government is running their, their workhouses, which I thought was interesting. Um, he talks a lot about the food and the rations that people get and kind of how people would just subsist on like a cup of tea a day and whatever crusts of bread they can scrounge up and really had no food whatsoever. Um, tobacco was still a big thing. People were enjoying tobacco and beer and he, you know, he complains about um, the alcoholism among the working classes and says people are, are drinking way too much uh, alcohol and beer and it's uh, even as children and it's really making them sluggish and making it harder for them to live but they do it to you know kind of dull the pain of their existence. He talks about just the the miserable living conditions with the disease and the the uh, vermin and things like that that people put up with. People die ignominiously alone in their apartments and you know no one knows who they are um, and in just the most horrible conditions of poverty. It's poverty you don't see in the developed world these days. It's very different. It's amazing how far we've come in the 120 years or so since this was written. You know, it's, um, we've made such incredible advances and it makes you think about you know, the cost of the Industrial Revolution versus the benefits, because clearly this was a bad transitional period in history where a lot of, you know, a lot of pollution was happening, a lot of poverty was happening, a lot of death was happening. People were all migrating from in the country and to the cities, and there was not enough work for them to do. There were more people who wanted work uh, than there was work to do. And clearly that resulted in a lot of pain and suffering. But the, you know, end result of the Industrial Revolution is an incredibly, incredible growth in productivity and, and global wealth and people being drawn out of uh, extreme poverty in, at greater rates than we've ever seen in the last hundred years. And so, you know, it's, it's interesting to kind of contrast those two things, the, the transition that was maybe painful at the time, but maybe led to good things later on. I don't know. I'm not saying that um, I'm going to answer that definitively, but I think it's interesting. And I think... You know, a lot of people kind of pined for the days, the pre-industrialized days, but, you know, there was a lot of starvation and a lot of poverty that happened then, too, in the rural areas. Maybe if you were, you know, rich in the city, you had it fine, but people who lived out in the, in the uh, less developed areas didn't do so well either. So I don't know. Um, it's interesting to kind of contrast these things and get a more complex picture of history. It's, uh, it's rarely as simple as we like to think it is. But I, I like to read this kind of stuff. I've read a few books on kind of the history of the Victorian period and how um, just 
disgusting. A lot of it was, you know, we have these kind of Hollywood movie ideas of what the Victorian period was like and how, you know, there's lace and doilies and frilly things and top coats and hats and all this stuff. But like, you don't hear about the piles of excrement on the sidewalks and the people who have to come in and clean your clean all the, the feces out of your house every night and things like that without the sanitation and the plumbing. You know, you really don't hear about all the really horrible stuff that went on. You just see the, the glamorized Hollywood movie take on these things. So it's nice to go back and read like actual real firsthand accounts. I don't think that London is exaggerating here. I think he's telling what he's telling it like he sees it. He's telling it like he saw. And that's interesting. And we should know that. You know, we should always remember where we came from and what things were like in the past because it's just so easy to have these kind of rose tinted glasses uh, view of the way things used to be and not be appreciative for how good we have it now. I think it's really important to go back and read things like this, read history and see what people were experiencing back in the times because it's easy for us to kind of imagine and impose our modern views onto the way things were back then. And that's not always the way it was. You know, uh, I am, have pretty strong differences with Jack London's political views, but I like to go back and see kind of what motivated them. And I think the idea of socialism in the late 19th century, early 20th century is a lot different than it is today because you can see what the conditions were like for people working in factories and people working in these slums and these cities. And uh, it was really awful. And you can understand why people would see that and reject it and say, this is terrible, there's got to be a better way. And it was before they had all the knowledge about the consequences of socialist countries like the USSR and China and uh, Cuba and things like that. So it's much more understandable why someone would be sympathetic to those ideas um, back in that time period. I also read a couple of essays in this book. He's got an essay on uh, called How I Became a Socialist, and he's got an essay about unions and strike breakers, scabs, and things like that. Um, and he's got an essay about kind of the coming socialist revolution written shortly before the Russian Revolution, which is a pretty fervent call for uh, the workers of the world to unite, which I found, you know, very interesting and a little bit, you know, sad in hindsight, given knowing how that turned out. But uh, it seems that Jack London sort of abandoned his socialist views a little bit later in his life and became disillusioned with the party. I don't know if he ever really gave up on the ideas, but he, he became disillusioned with the political process, which is certainly understandable. One of the other interesting things about this that I found was that a lot of the complaints London has and the things that he uses to justify his socialist views are not things that modern socialists would really be upset about. It was, you think of modern socialism as being very pro-government, big government, uh, having a more interventionist state to take control of things, take control of the economy and regulate things. Uh, London actually has a lot of complaints about what the government was doing at the time, and it's more of an anti-government philosophy, which I found pretty interesting. Like, for example, there were all these laws in London at the time against vagrancy, against begging, um, that were preventing people from being able to, you know, get enough money to live, and people would be arrested for sleeping out uh, in outdoors. Like, obviously, that's terrible. The way the prisons were run seems terrible, and I guess that's a little bit in common with uh, some, you know, socialist complaints about police now, but, you know, we don't have those laws now, so it doesn't really apply. Um, he also is kind of critical of unions, which I thought was interesting. You know, usually uh, these people are very supportive of unions. He was complaining about the unions because the unions would force you to become a member. They would have closed shop uh, working where you'd have to become a member of the union in order to get a job. And then the unions would soak you for all these fees, all these membership fees that the members couldn't afford. And so he was very critical of that too. So a lot of his complaints are really not complaints with capitalism at all. They're complaints about government action, which I'm very much more sympathetic to. There's also a, a fairly ironic and amusing part in the essay about how he became a socialist, about uh, how when he was down on his luck and he kind of came in out of the wilderness um, to live among civilized people, they, uh, the authorities forcibly vaccinated him and he was upset about that. And I was like, oh, that's kind of relevant for this year, isn't it? It's interesting to see that that was a complaint that the socialists had back in those days instead of you know the opposite now, a lot of socialists demanding forced vaccinations rather than uh, being opposed to them. In his essays, London talks about how he started off as this rugged individualist who was strong and healthy and young, and he would go out into the wilderness and, and work hard and, and make a living and could do all these things. And uh, it was kind of being in the cities and observing people living in those situations that made him less so of an individualist because he realized that, you know, I'm not going to be young forever. I'm not going to be strong forever. I'm not going to be healthy forever. Someday I'm going to need help. And in that case, I want other people to be there to help me, which is a very reasonable thing to want. 
and uh, he that's what kind of led him to having more socialist views. And it's, it's, you really see that kind of individual spirit in his novels, in things like White Fang and The Call of the Wild. He always calls it the law of tooth and claw. But it also has a little bit of a Hobbesian kind of, um, you know, anti individualist nature to it as well because the, the law of tooth and claw is the brute nasty brutal and short um, nature of existence that Thomas Hobbes talked about about how kind of everyone's on their own and if you can't hack it you're going to die and that's you know I think it's natural to assume that that's what people who don't like socialism want and that's not really the case like people who don't like socialism don't want everyone to just be an island and be on their own and be, you know, thrown to the wolves if, if they get sick. They want people to help each other voluntarily. They want cooperation. Uh, what they object to is coercion, and what they object to is the state use of violence and things like that, which I think a lot of people miss the point. But I think it, in in that time period, in the late 19th, early 20th century, it was a lot harder to kind of understand that distinction. And people thought, oh, we'll just all get together and everybody will, you know, cooperate and live happily and it'll be fine. And then socialism in practice turned into very something, something very, very different um, because it turns out you can't actually run an economy centrally without using force. Like it requires the use of uh, violence and force. And, I, you know, I've studied economics and I have my master's degree in it and I've worked in politics for a long time. So I've read a lot about this subject. So I kind of know, you know, it, it, it does require uh the use of force eventually once you get far enough, far enough down the road. But again, this was, you know, 150 years ago, 120 years ago, people didn't have the hindsight that we have today. And I really think it's important to listen to um, people that have different points of view on this, especially, you know, going back and looking at the history of it, because it's, it's a, it's a different way of looking at things and they had a different circumstances to respond to. And you need to try to understand where they're coming from and not just be so judgmental of them and condemn them outright. I think if you listen to the arguments that Jack London makes, it's, it's easy to be sympathetic to a lot of them, even though we might not agree with them today. Um, and I, I just think that's a, it's a good way to broaden your uh, intellectual views and to become a more understanding and empathetic person is to listen to people who you disagree with and try to see where they're coming from. So that was my take on uh, the People of the Abyss specifically, but more broadly the social light writings of Jack London. There's a few more novels in here that I haven't read before. I think they all are a little bit more politically focused than the earlier ones, so I'm excited to read them. Things like The Iron Heel, which I know is a famous one. Uh, I will get to those at some point, but in my lovely Library of America editions, I love the Library of America, and I always try to get their books when I can. That's been my review for today. Thank you so much for watching. I've been your host, Logan Albright, and I hope you'll check back soon for more videos. Subscribe to the channel, like the video, leave me a comment, and don't forget to pre-order my new book, Conform or Be Cast Out, The Literal Demonization of Nonconformists. Link in the description, available now. Thank you so much. I'll catch you next time.